about this yesterday. My, my friend called me, my favorite Bible teacher friend, Brother Ed Luongo. And we usually talk on Saturdays and we just share the scriptures over the phone and we look for little nuances and things. And we were talking yesterday about magnetism and electricity. And there's something spiritual about those things. There's something going on there. Uh, it's very interesting. One of these days you study Job and you study the Psalms and you see how the lightning runs to and fro and says, Here I am, Lord. And he talks about lightning as being like the angels that move. And remember, electricity was found in lightning. And the electricity we have today is alternating current. It runs to and fro and to and fro and to and fro. It's just some interesting things about magnetism and, and electricity. So, thank you, Lord. And <laughs> there might be other spirits trying to shut us down. So, we see this term Jehovah Jireh in Genesis 22 and verse 14. Jehovah Jireh. Now, as I was reading through Psalm 104, it starts out in the first verse, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, Thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty. And as I was reading through this, I noticed the things that he does. For example, in verse 5, The Lord who laid the foundations of the earth, that it should not be removed forever. Thou coverest it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. At thy rebuke they fled. At the voice of thy thunder they hasted away. They go up by the mountains. They go down by the valleys under the place which thou hast founded them. Thou hast set a bound that they may not pass over, that they turn not again to cover the earth. And he's talking about water. God's got the water under control. He's got the oceans under control. The Lord will provide. What we're going to see through the Scriptures is the Lord will provide many things. The Lord will provide... And I noticed a number of things going through the Scriptures that the Lord will provide for. The first thing He'll provide for is creation. The Lord will provide for the creation that He's made. One of the things the psalmist mentions right here is just the simple fact that He's provided for this planet water. Now, that's an interesting thing. Because, you know, we send these space probes up out there and we take a look and the astronomers, they, they divide the, the planets into the near planets and the far planets and the first four, Mercury, Venus, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, they're near to the sun. And then the ones that are further out, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, they're further out past the asteroid belt. And they figure you can't have life there because it's too far away, it's too cold. But the first four maybe could have life. So they send probes up there and, and they had a probe that got close to the planet Mercury and they looked at that planet and they found out that it was exceedingly hot because it's very close to the sun. Uh, they thought of sending a probe down and they, they were able to do some radio studies from it, but they, they found that the, the surface, the rocks on the surface of, of Mercury were so hot that, that it would melt lead. Okay, so lead melts at about 327 degrees Fahrenheit. I know ladies that cook, I, I guess that's a good temperature to cook things at. So, I mean, if you send that down, the lead would melt. So, maybe a probe's not a good idea. Maybe titanium or steel would work. But even if you sent that down there, everything inside would cook. All the electronics would cook in there. So, they didn't send any probes onto the surface of that planet. So, then they moved closer to, little, to Venus. And they moved, uh, which is closer to Earth and further from the sun. And Venus was a nice uh, planet about the size of Earth and covered with clouds. And they, they did some experiments going through the clouds. And the first thing they found was there are great hills and valleys on Venus. Some of the valleys deeper than the Grand Canyon. Big, deep hills and valleys there. Not a real good terrain for living on. But it had all the cloud cover, which seemed to hold out some of the sun rays. But surprisingly, when they were sending a probe down, it was hotter and the rocks on Venus glow at about 820 degrees because the clouds trap all the heat and it can't escape. So it's even hotter on Venus than it is there. You're not going to support life there. And when they went to Mars, what they found out was Mars was so far away from the sun that the average temperature was about 40 degrees below Fahrenheit. This is on the sunny side of Mars. That's the average temperature, 40 below. Well, now we're getting close to living conditions. I'm thinking of the Snyders up in Alaska. I mean, we could send them as missionaries to Mars and it'd be, right? <laughs> they wouldn't mind. Huh? But anyways, when they got up there, let's say Brother Dan got up there and now he's on Mars and it's cold and he's got his parka, but he wants to go out and he wants to build a fire. There's no vegetation. There's nothing that you can, can burn. But thankfully, Brother Dan is resourceful and he brought some logs and there's a little trace of oxygen up there and he's able to combust those logs. And what they find is... There's, there's traces of ice on Mars. So all you've got to do is just melt the ice and you'd have some water. Curious thing is, when you put it in a pan and you melt it, it doesn't change the water. It evaporates instantly. It will not exist on the surface 
uh, of Mars in the form of liquid water. It will, it, what it does is it's called sublimation. When something goes from a solid to a, a gas state, it will not exist as a liquid because the atmosphere is so thin up there that uh, there's not enough pressure to maintain it in liquid form. You've got to study the gas law, PV equals NRT. But there's not enough pressure in there, no matter what the temperature is, to maintain it in liquid form. And so it just goes from uh, solid to vapor. But here on planet Earth, there's just the right temperature and just the right atmosphere that God provides for the creation that which is needed. He covered it, verse 6, with the deep as with a garment. And there's the water and we have the whole water cycle and we have a, 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 an entire planet that's teeming with life because of the water. Water is needed for all life. No life can exist without water. Plant life, animal life, or, or human life cannot exist without water. All the chemical processes that go on in our body go on in a, in a liquid milieu, an environment of water that's inside of us. We're two-thirds water. The plants are anywhere from three-quarters to nine-tenths water. All, all around this planet, there's water. And God sets bounds for it. I mean, I went to the ocean side, and there it is. It's bounded. The ocean, it's bounded there. He set bounds for that thing. It's good because if it were everywhere, we'd be swimming and it'd be a mess. We wouldn't have any vegetation. We wouldn't have any place to, to drive our cars or to build our houses. There's so much water on the earth. I was, I was studying this. In, in one cubic mile of water, that'd be a mile by a mile by a mile deep. And by the way, the deepest part of the ocean is 36,000 feet deep. Now, just think about it. You ever fly on an airplane? We're now traveling at 30,000, 32,000 feet. Okay, the 32,000 feet up is high. The deepest part of the ocean is 36,000 feet down. That's 4,000 feet above that plane that's flying up there. That's how deep the ocean is. God made a big earth. People say this is a, it's a small world. No, it's not. It's a great big world. It's a beautiful world. And we're the small things on it. But anyways, that, there's so much water that if you take a mile by a mile by a mile, within one cubic mile of, of uh, water, there is one million million gallons. A million million, take a million, then take a second million, then two, and count a million times, a million times a million in a cubic mile. And there are 326 million cubic miles of water on this planet. So I don't know how many gallons that is. You can do the math. So, but God's provided for the creation. He's provided the necessary things for us. The Lord will provide. Sometimes we forget these things. You know, we just take things for granted. But the Lord has provided for His creation. For example, read in verse 13. He watereth the hills from his chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of thy works. I mean, the Lord, he, He's provided for the creation. He set a water cycle in place so that not only is there water in the oceans, but He finds a way to evaporate it and there are invisible clouds and then what happens is it condenses a little bit and they become visible clouds and then it condenses a little bit more and precipitate gets in there and it falls out of the clouds in the form of snow or rain and he waters the hills. And there's a water cycle that it runs down the hill into underground strings, springs and, and streams and some comes out in wells and some goes right back into the ocean and he's got a beautiful water cycle. The Lord is into recycling. He started it before any of the environmentalists did. I mean, he's, and he's got it worked out. Every glass of water that you and I drink has thousands and thousands of water molecules that have been recycled thousands and thousands of times. We're not going to run out of water, people. I know there's, I've read articles in newspapers and magazines that we're going to run out of water. We can't. We haven't. It's not going anywhere. It just keeps recycling on the earth. It's the same amount and He takes care of it and He waters the hills. We don't have to worry about these things. The Lord will provide. He provides for the creation. That's the first thing He provides for. Notice the other thing He provides for. Pick it up in verse 11 and 12 about the water. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild asses quench their thirst. By them shall the fowls of the heaven have their habitation which sing among the branches. He's taking care. Look at verse 14. He causeth the grass to grow for the cattle and herb for the service of man that he may bring forth food out of the earth. He's going to not only take care of creation, he's going to take care of the creatures down here. The Lord will provide for everything that's necessary to sustain life down here. He provides for the creation. He provides for the earth. 
He says in one verse here, in verse 19, He appointeth the moon for seasons. The sun knoweth is going down. He saw to it that we have a moon that's exactly one quarter size of the earth. It's just the right size. And it's just the right distance from the earth, about 230,000 miles, to make the tides go properly. And all the seasons ebb and flow. So we have winter. And we have spring, which we really like. And summer, which I like even more. I wear short sleeve shirts. But I was told they don't look good on TV. So I'll wear a shirt and tie. And then we have fall. And then we have, we have all those wonderful seasons the Lord provided for all these things the things we take for granted for every single day he provides for the creation he provides for the creatures look at verses 16 through 18 the trees of the Lord are full of sap the cedars of Lebanon which he hath planted where the birds make their nests as for the stork the fir trees are her house I mean God's taking care of all the creatures down here he, he formed the SPCA, the Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, long before any human being thought of it. He was taking care of the creatures down here. And he takes care of all the little things. The sparrows are not lost in his sight. There's not a sparrow that falls to the ground that he doesn't know. The Lord provides for all these things. I, I'm just amazed when I, when I look at uh, those Discovery Channel and I watch those various creatures, whether they be sea creatures or air creatures or land creatures, and I watch the different shapes and the varieties and the way some have a different spine, some don't have a spine, some are mammalian, some are reptilian, and I look at, and I think God designed all these things and provided a way that there would be a, a food cycle for them to be taken care of. I mean, he's got it so that when one dies, the nitrogen and the carbon is broken down a certain way and the trees draw that up and they take the carbon dioxide and they turn it to oxygen. And he's provided for all these little nuances that scientists are still studying. And that's our Lord. He's provided for the creation. He's provided for the creatures. And notice another thing he provides for uh, in verse 30. Uh, Thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created. Now, he's talking about people here. Thou renewest the face of the earth. He's talking about a new generation of coming on the face of the earth and renewing it by sending forth the Spirit and letting new... He's talking about he provides for children. And every generation, a new crop of children is growing on the earth. He sends forth his Spirit and then he allows mommies and daddies to make the body and he brings that thing together and he renews the whole face of the earth with a, with a whole new group of faces as new people come forth and a new generation. And he provides for children. As a matter of fact, Psalm 113. Just quickly at one verse. Psalm 113. And look at verse 9. He maketh the barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise you, the Lord. See, children are an heritage and a gift of the Lord. And, and I like this verse. I'll tell you why I like it. Because in my business, you know, in the medical business, lots of times you run into couples who are having trouble having a, a child, you know. And so then they come and they see these, these specialists in, in reproductive or fertility medicine and they go through all this kind of testing. And you know what's interesting is is behind all that is the Lord supervening in that thing. And, and so often the doctor will take credit for it, but it's the Lord that maketh the barren women to keep house and maketh a joyful mother. It's the Lord that's behind that thing. In the Lord's timing, when He's ready, He brings forth the children. It's God that's behind it. He provides for all these things. The Lord provides for these things. It ought to just bless your heart to know that God is into this. God loves people. So, so He puts a creation here. He puts creatures here. He puts children here. He puts children here that so we can have joy down here. Look at, uh, go back to where we were in Psalm 104 and look at verse uh, 23. Man goeth forth unto his work and to his labor until the evening and then back up and look at verses 14 and 15 because God causeth the grass to grow for the cattle and herb for the service of man that he that's the man may bring forth food out of the earth and wine that maketh glad the heart of man and oil to make his face to shine and bread which strengtheneth man's heart all the food that you and I have down here was provided for by God but he wants us to co-labor with him. That's why he said in that, in that 23rd verse that the man must go forth unto his work and to his labor. You see, God's provided, but then he asks us to co-labor with him. 
So, you know, you see food shortages down here and you wonder, well, what's the matter with God? Can He provide enough for this planet? Well, actually, in the studies that I've done and the Department of Agriculture has done, there is enough food growing capacity on this planet to support 50 billion people. We have about 6 billion. He said, but there's food shortages around the world. There are places where people are starving. Let me show you the two reasons why there's food shortages. It's not God's fault. Some people shake the fist at God and blame Him. The 23rd verse showed you the first reason why there might be a food shortage. Man goeth forth unto his work and to his labor until the evening. What if the man doesn't work? What if men don't work? You know, it says in the field of the slothful there's much food. The problem is he doesn't go forth and take it out. So one of the reasons we have food shortages down here is just old laziness and slothfulness. There's some people that won't work. Work is a good thing. But there's some people that don't want to work. And so you'll go to areas where there's work not going on. There's one reason. There's laziness and slothfulness. A second reason this goes on is found in verse 35. Let the sinners be consumed out of the earth. The second reason is sometimes there's just sinful government. There's sinful people over a particular area that's preventing work from being done. There are governments that literally stifle work, that prevent work from going on. There are people like Saddam Hussein and Muammar Gaddafi that impoverish, and, and Fidel Castro, that impoverish their very people. And they make it to a point where they can't work. There's no incentive to work and the people don't work and they've impoverished them because of the sinners. So slothfulness and sin are two of the reasons there's food shortages, but the provider is not the reason that there's food shortages because he provided. He saw to it that there's plenty of grass and there's plenty of herbs and there's plenty of creatures and there's plenty of water to take care of these things. The Lord has provided for all these things. He's provided for the children. He's provided for their nativity and seeing that they're born. He's provided for their needs and taking care of everything. But let me tell you, going back to where we started in Genesis chapter 22, it's good that God's provided for creation. It's good that God's provided for creatures and for children. But the greatest provision that God's ever made, the seeds are found right here. See, when Abraham took this journey and he was working his way up the hill, in verse 7, his son Isaac spake and said unto Abraham his father, he said, My father, he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. And as they came to the place which God had told them of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood, and Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son, and the angel of the Lord called unto him from out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything to him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Now, you know where Abraham did this? Where he was taken? God directed him in verse 2. He said, Take now thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And that very mountain, about 2,000 years later, was the one that the Lord Jesus Christ ascended, carrying His cross. As He went there, in His mind, while he was hanging on that tree, was on you and me. As he went up on Calvary's cross and the Lord provided the lamb that Isaac asked about. Because that ram that was there that day could never take away the sins of the world. Why? Because look what Hebrews 10 tells us. Hebrews chapter 10, picking it up in verse 5. In that very mount, 2,000 years later, the Lord provided Himself a lamb. Because in... Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Verse 5, Wherefore, when He cometh into the world, the Lord Jesus Christ, He saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come. 
in the volume of the book it's written of me. I come to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offering and offering for sin thou wouldst not, neither hadst pleasure therein which are offered by the law, then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. The greatest thing that Jehovah Jireh ever, Jireh ever pr provided for us is the Christ. The Christ, the Anointed One. The Messiah. Why? Because the creation and the creatures and the children, now we all groan and travail together in pain, bearing the burden of sin that's been upon us since the fall in the Garden of Eden. And Isaac knew and Abraham knew that an offering had to be given. But Isaac said, where will we get the offering? And he said very carefully, he said, God will provide himself a lamb. He didn't say God Himself will provide a lamb. He said God will provide Himself a lamb. And God made Himself the lamb in the form of Jesus Christ. And He provided the Christ. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Why is that? I'll show you why. Go past Hebrews a little bit to the right to 1 John chapter 3 and read the 16th verse. 1 John 3.16 Like we heard in the song today, what would motivate God to do such a thing? Why would, why would He provide His Son? Because in verse 16, 1 John 3.16, Hereby perceive we the love of God because He laid down His life for us. God was motivated by love. All the things that Jehovah Jireh, all the things the Lord has provided for you and for me has come out of a heart of love, uh, an ocean of love. I think that's one of the reasons why God put oceans down here. So we could get an idea of just how great His love is. Just how great that love is. If all the oceans were ink and the pens a scroll, we couldn't mark all the love that God has for us in His heart. One of the songists said that, and it's just so true. Perceive we the love of God because He laid down His life for us. And all you and I have to do is to place our faith in Jesus Christ. When we rest, in Jesus, then the Lamb has been provided. But it's not until the time that you and I trust Him. We stand back and I was reading a poem in uh, Spurgeon's book. He says, Nature with open volume stands to spread her Maker's praise abroad and every labor of His hands so shows something worthy of our God. But in the grace that rescued man, His brightest form of glory shines. Here on the cross, his fairest drawn in precious blood and crimson lines. Here I behold God's innermost heart, where grace and vengeance strangely join, piercing His Son with the sharpest smart to make the purchased pleasures mine. Jesus, how glorious is Thy grace when in Thy name we trust. Our faith receives a righteousness that makes the sinner just. The Lord will provide. The Lord has provided. But how about you? Have you received His provision? Have you turned? You see, this is why God reveals His name to you and me. He wants us to know He'll take care of our greatest needs. Our greatest needs aren't food and shelter and clothing. Our greatest need is salvation. And He's provided the Lamb, Jesus Christ. Would you open your heart to Him today? Let's pray. Father, we thank You for providing for our needs Thank You for the great and precious earth and the planet we live on. Thank You for the beautiful creatures we get to look at. Thank You for the food You've given to us. Thank You for the children that we enjoy. But Lord, we desire to become children of Thy kingdom. Thank You for providing Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Help us, Lord, to open our hearts and to receive the salvation You so freely give. Hereby perceive we the love of God that Your Son laid down His life for us. Help us to confess Him as Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We turn it over 160.
All right, we're on. Okay, and so we're, we're looking this morning in, in Psalm 5, and, and what we're doing is we're continuing a series of studies that we began a few weeks ago on the names of God. We saw how that names mean something, and God is revealing His names to us through the Scriptures. So as we look at Psalm 5 this morning, we see that this is a Psalm of David, and David says in here, we'll read verses 1 through 3, uh, he says, Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God. For unto thee will I pray. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and will look up. Uh, verses 11 and 12. But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. For thou, Lord, wilt bless the righteous with favor. Wilt thou compass him as with a shield. Compass is to go around him, to be all around him with a shield. Now you notice in this particular psalm, you will see a, a, a word that is the most common word used for God in the scriptures is Lord. Lord. And notice how it is in the first verse. It's capital L, capital O, capital R, and capital D. Now, this is the most common form in the Scriptures. We saw God and we saw the compound names of God. But now he wants to bring to us this term here, Lord. This term, Lord. Now, this term starts all the way back in Genesis, chapter 2. So, I'll take you there so we can get a look at this. Now, if you notice, in chapter 1, you never see that term, Lord. All you see in chapter 1 is God. In the beginning, God. And then God does all His work. And all through there you see the term God. Again, God doesn't prove Himself. He just takes for granted that He exists. And, and we ought to take that for granted too. God is out there. And He shows the work that He does. In that first chapter of Genesis, we've already studied in, in our studies, midweek studies. And we looked at that and we saw how God is showing the way that He works. And uh, in that first chapter we see that our God is one that doesn't rush. He takes His time doing things. Which is good. So we don't need to rush about, folks. We can take our time in doing things. God has given us time to do things and that's the way He works. In chapter 2, though, He's going to reiterate the most important part of what He did. And what He's going to reiterate is that sixth day when He made man. And you see in verse 4, the introduction of the term Lord. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heaven. And throughout the rest of this chapter, we're going to see that term. Look in the fifth verse. You'll see it again. Middle of the verse. For the Lord God. See? Verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden. Verse 9. And the Lord God to grow every tree. And, and you see all through here the introduction of this term, the Lord. And it comes in chapter 2. It's not in chapter 1. As we saw before, the, the term God was a, was a term that everybody knows. The heathen used the word God. They use it frequently with another word, uh, D-A-M-N. They seem to put those two together all the time as if that's his last name. But, and, and I'm sure we all did it when we were unsaved. I, I know I did it. And those of you that didn't, Lord bless you. But, but you see, God is kind of a, a generic term for a deity entity that's out there. And the heathen, they have gods too. But the Lord gets a little bit more personal. And the Lord is a more personal thing. Now, this is a very sacred term to the Jewish people. As a matter of fact, the way it's translated in the King James Holy Bible, you see it with the all caps there. Notice the L is capital, the O is capital, the R is capital, the D is capital. Because every one of those comes from a, a Hebrew letter. There are four Hebrew letters that make that, that word. So, maybe give you an idea. Turn to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. This particular psalm is an interesting psalm. It uh, is the longest chapter in the Bible. It has 176 verses. It teaches you a lot about the Word of God. And it comes, of course, from the Hebrew. It's, uh, God translated it for us into English in the King James Bible. But originally, this was in uh, Hebrew. And it has 22 sections to it. Each section lines up with a Hebrew letter. 
Matter of fact, they ought to have it in your Bible. Some Bibles may have taken it away. Look, just before verse 1, above it there should be a title, Aleph. And then just after verse 8 and between 9, Beth. Now, all the Hebrew letters are, are go through in an acrostic fashion in this particular psalm, in the 22 sections. And for the letters that are used to make up the word Lord are found in here. In, in uh, 73, verse 73, right before that, you will see the letter Jod. Jod. I, mean, I want to write this properly for you. So, the L would line up with Jod. That would be the letter that we'd find in Hebrew. The O that we would find comes from the letter that's found just before verse 33. The he. H E. He. The R would be found right after uh, verse 40 and between verse 41. Uh, the, the vowel. Vowel. And then the very last letter, uh, they return back to the one before 33 with the he. The way it looks in Hebrew, by the way, the Hebrew, they write backwards from us. So the Yad looks like a little, kind of like a little uh, apostrophe, like this. It's up above the line. And then the He looks like a, this. A little bit further over. And then it closes like that. And then the vowel looks like this. It comes all the way down to the bottom. And then the He would be over here again. And it would be Yad, He, Vau, He. And that's, they write in this direction. They write opposite to us. And the way it works out would be, it would be um, Y, H, W, H, transliterated, would be those Hebrew. Yahweh, Yahweh, or Yahweh. And, and uh, constantly in English, the, the Y becomes a J, Yahweh. And, and we get the word Jehovah from that. And so, now, that would be the, the Hebrew of it there. Now, this is called the tetragrammaton. Tetra is four, and grammaton is, is grammatical letters. So, it's got four letters to it. This is the famous tetragrammaton that is found in the Scriptures that would refer to Lord. And it's introduced here in the, in the second chapter. Now, it, now that we've looked at all that, I just get that, put that up for uh, knowledge sake. Let's see what it means to us in terms of uh, the Scriptures. What the Lord means and what He tries to do with this particular name as He brings it forward. There are certain aspects that He wants to bring forward to us with this name. And the first aspect of this name that we're going to find is it's a term, a name of reverence. And we see it right away as He introduces it in the second chapter here. In the second chapter of uh, Genesis in verse 4, it says this about the Lord God. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And so, this is someone to be revered. The Lord God is someone to be revered. He made the heavens and the earth. That, that's pretty amazing. I have trouble building model airplanes. I remember once... Uh, <laughs> I mean, I just... You know, and they have the instructions and the glue and everything is right there. Once when I was a little kid, uh, my dad bought me a, a model car that was the Aston Martin that James Bond drove in that movie with Ajad, uh, whatever that was, that movie was Goldfinger or something. And I tried for weeks to put that thing together there. And I had all the parts and all the instructions and couldn't get it right. Here, he made the heavens and the earth. This is someone to be revered. Amen. This is someone to be revered. This is a name that's associated with reverence. In, in the next book of the Bible, in Exodus chapter 3, when Moses comes close to him in the burning bush, and in the fifth verse, I mean, this is reverence. And, and Moses is coming close and the Lord says to him in the fifth verse in Exodus 3, 5, And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. This is a name associated with reverence. This is holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. 
This is someone to be revered. This is a name of great reference. The same thing happened to Joshua when the angel of the Lord appeared to him and he was the captain of salvation and he bowed down and he said, Draw, take thy shoes from off thy feet. The same with Joshua. We were in the book of Psalms originally and notice the psalmist David. Go back to where we were. All through that psalm, he refers to the Lord. As a matter of fact, I was looking at the psalms and I was just looking at the first five psalms and all through there you see the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. Very little do you see the word God. And I'm going to show you why that is in a moment. But the psalms just magnify this particular term, Lord, Lord. As a matter of fact, in the Scriptures, we find the word God about 2,300 times, but the word Lord 5,321 times in the Old Testament alone, not even counting New Testament counting. So, I mean, this is a name that God is magnifying and lifting up as the Lord, L-O-R-D, all caps, as a, as a name of reference. Psalm 33, for example. Psalm 33. Name of reverence. And verse 8. He tells you to rejoice in the Lord. He said, praise the Lord. He said, the heavens were made by the, the word of the Lord. And then he says in verse 8, and let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. I hear this all the time. People say, As this is awesome, or that's awesome, or this guy is awesome. But nobody's awesome except God. Amen. And it's the bottom line. That, that my vocabulary reserves that word for one person alone, God. The Lord is awesome. Let all the world stand in awe of Him. Everything we do... Come on, folks, it's, it's small potatoes compared to what God has done and what He's continuing to do and what He will do in the future. And so the Lord, it's a term of great reverence. First thing. But the second thing we see about this term, why He brings it forward and He brings it forward so soon, is look back in Genesis chapter 2 with me and notice right away in the seventh verse. The second thing that he wants is he brings this term forward. First, he brings it forth in a reverential manner, reminding you that he made the heavens and the earth. But the second thing he does is in verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. And you know what we see here? We see relationship. This is a term reserved for relationship. Again, think about it. Think about in your life and in mine. Before you knew Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, when I wasn't certain about things, I wasn't even sure there was a God, that's all I could refer to as God. I'm not sure if there's a God or there isn't a God. That's, that's about as close as you get when you don't know Him. But when you get to know Him, all of a sudden things change. I don't refer to Him much as God anymore. I understand He's God, but He's my Lord. I call Him Lord when I pray to Him. I talk to the Lord Jesus. It's a relation. Look how close they were. I mean, He breathed into His nostrils the breath of life. You know, when you want to revive someone, you do mouth to mouth. Well, he, He's a step above us. He does mouth to nose. And, and that's what He did. And He breathes in the breath of life. But you've got to get close to do that. And that's a term of intimate relationship. And that's where the Lord, He brings this term forward because it's the relationship that we have. If you're not sure who He is, then He's just a God far out there. But if you get close to Him, then He's the Lord. As a matter of fact, look at Psalm 144. Psalm 144. See, this term is, is reserved for relationship. Yes, there's reverence. But there's also relationship. Think about that. Someone who's awesome. Someone who we stand in awe of. Who's so holy and so reverent. And at the same time, He beckons us come close into relationship. That's what we have here. Psalm 144. And look at verse 15. Happy is that people that is in such a case. Yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. See the relationship? I mean, we have great blessings and happiness because we know that reverential Lord. He's drawn us into a personal relationship with us, you know, one to another. What a, what a great thing that He's drawn us into relationship with Him. So, so it's a reverential term, but it's a relationship term. And, and I don't, you almost never hear unsafe people using that term. I mean, even with the swear words, there's a swear word for God, but there's not one for Lord. That's a relationship term. God is just some generic thing out there, but the Lord is relationship. And the happy is the people whose God is the Lord. Of course, blessed is that nation whose God is the Lord. 
And the only nation I know of in the New Testament is the church, the holy nation, whose God is the Lord. And thank you, Lord. Thank you for blessing the church. And thank you for letting us be a peculiar people who are blessed by you. But we have the happiness because our God is the Lord. Go after Psalms to Isaiah 64. Isaiah 64. And when you get to Isaiah 64, look at the, the, uh, the eighth verse. Watch, watch how close the relationship is. He says, Isaiah says, But now, Lord, watch this, Thou art our Father. Talk about relationship. A family relationship. Can it get any closer than father and child, parent and child? You see that the term is reserved not just for reverence, but for relationship as he draws us close. As I was looking at the difference, you know, the wicked say in their heart, there is no God. The fool says there is no God. Notice he doesn't use the term Lord. And as I was looking in Matthew chapter 2, when the wise men were told in a dream, it says God appeared unto them in a dream. The wise men hadn't quite gotten into that relationship. But when Joseph, it says the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. The Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Interesting. The relationship. But the third thing that comes with it is also found in Genesis 2. Go back to Genesis 2. Not only is there reverence, not only is there relationship associated with that particular name that God brings forth, but in the 15th and 16th verses, notice the next thing that comes forth in Genesis 2 and 15 and 16. Here's the term, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded a man saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. You know what's happening here? There's, there's reverence, there's relationship, and there's one other thing when you know that God. There's responsibility. There's responsibility. I want to know my rights. You know, you have the right... <laughs> to go to hell for your sins. I mean, you have the right to take Jesus Christ as your Savior, but then what? Then you have that, that relationship with God as you revere that Lord. You have the Lord that you revere. You have relationship. And then you have responsibility to that Lord, to that same Lord that loved you so much that He drew you close and that same Lord that now has given you life and imparted life unto you. You have responsibility. What are the responsibilities? One of the responsibilities the Lord told Moses, He said, I will give them manna, bread from heaven and they shall draw a certain rate every day. We have responsibility to His Word. In Psalm 5 that we read, we saw that David said, Lord, unto Thee will I pray. We have the responsibility to spend time with God in prayer. He said, O Lord, I will praise Thee. We have the responsibility to praise the Lord. The Lord also told Ezekiel, He said, Son of man, Thus saith the Lord, go and be a watchman unto the house of Israel and give them warning from Me. We have the responsibility to witness for the Lord. These are the responsibilities that come. But they're precious responsibilities. They're blessed responsibilities because of the relationship He goes with us in every single one. He empowers us in every single one. The Lord, the Lord, the one that we revere, the one that's drawn us, Thou art our Father, Lord. Now, gives us some precious responsibilities to go forth with Him. But let me show you a, a very important responsibility that sometimes is missed. Go to Psalm 116. Psalm 116. You know, as, as we go through the Scriptures, and now for the next number of weeks, we are going to start looking at this term, L-O-R-D, all caps. And we're going to follow it through the Scriptures. And we're going to see that God will do the same thing with that term, L-O-R-D, that He did with G-O-D. He's going to make compound terms out of it and introduce us more into fellowship through the names that He, that he brings forth. But, but one thing that's so important in Psalm 116 and in, and in verse 13, Here's one of the greatest responsibilities for every person on the planet. Verse 13, I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. You see, you know what, you know what he wants? He wants to move you from chapter 1 to chapter 2. That's why he waited for ch till chapter 2 to put the term there. Because in chapter 1, all you know about is a far-off, powerful Creator God. And in chapter 2, chapter 1 is your first birth. And chapter 2 is the second birth. Chapter 2 is the new birth. And in the new birth, He'd like to move you to the Lord. He'd like to bring you into a reverential relationship with some responsibility. And you know how He wants to do it? You've got to do it this way. You've got to take the cup of salvation and call upon, not God, but the name of the Lord. Would you like to move from chapter 1 to chapter 2 in your life? Would you like to do that? You see, the Lord is offering the cup of salvation. 
Jesus says, this is the everlasting covenant in my blood. The cup that the Father gave him. That he, that he took at Calvary as he went up there. And he bare the sin of the world. And he taketh away the sin of the world. And what we need to do is we need to take that cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. And you go from chapter 1 to chapter 2. And no longer is he just God. He's now my Lord and my God. And then he becomes our Lord. And that's, that's what he wants to teach us. Very simply carefully as he writes the scriptures and he begins to progressively reveal himself to us. Notice how carefully he did it from chapter 1 to chapter 2. What a perfect writing we have in our hands in this Holy Bible. And the Lord wants to draw and he says, will you take the cup of salvation? Will you take the cup of salvation? It's very simple to take. All it takes, it's taken in humility because God resisted the proud but He giveth grace unto the humble. It's taken in humility as you get down and you realize that Jesus Christ is the one that bare the sins of Calvary's cross. That you couldn't bear them. That you and I were in the condemnation that we deserve for the things we've done. But He was without sin. And He bare sins in His body on the tree. Would you call upon the name of the Lord and take the cup of salvation? That's the invitation that God has. Has He liked to move you from the old life to the new life. From chapter 1 the first birth, the chapter 2 and the new birth, and to learn of the Lord in reverence, in relationship, and responsibility. Let's pray. Father, we thank You so much. Thou art our Father, Lord, and we are the clay. And we, we ask, Lord, that You show us our responsibilities and mold us and make us to carry out those responsibilities. And Lord, one of those is to be a watchman and to take the cup of salvation and to offer it to others. Lord, help us this week to take some people out there who only know of God and to show them the Lord, the precious Lord Jesus Christ. In His name we pray. Amen.